Well, today is the beginning of our time spent studying the doctrine of God. Now, we don't mean the doctrine that God produced. We mean the doctrine that is God. And in this, there is a 10-unit uh, course of material to study, and within each unit, there are three sub-studies. And today, we're going to look at the first half of an introduction to God. Basics foundational. Uh, it sounds like an oversimplification, but an introduction to God is an excellent way to step into contemporary understanding of who God is. Now, when you introduce God to someone, how do we do that? What is the way that that commonly occurs? we tend to say, oh, God's got that covered. God can handle that. We also tend to say, well, if you'd quit doing this, you'd quit being punished by God. And that's not necessarily true. God is a God of thoroughness, completeness, follow through, but he's not a God who lays retribution upon mankind today in the way that it happened in the Old Testament. The New Testament describes a God that is just, that is compassionate, and that has put provision in front of need. That's to say, he put provision to, to have mankind use to deal with being human. He put that provision in place before mankind even existed. And that provision is Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we look at our most basic religious belief, and it is that God exists. He is. Uh, by the capitalized word God, uh, we mean the God described in the Bible. And that is a God of many historical stories. The story of Abraham, the story of Moses and Aaron, the story of a God who waited for his son to go up on the side of the mountain to pray and spend time with him. And uh, as some would say, Jesus sweat so much that blood came out of his skin. Now, when I say sweat that much, Think of it this way. He went with so much need and so much desire to spend fellowship with his father that in his passionate prayer and in his very, very determined manner, he was so deeply ingrained in the prayer and in that relationship with his father that he actually had blood come through the pores of his skin. And that action has been documented as something that happens in human beings from time to time, all driven by a God, the Father. Now, can anybody understand God totally, completely, in all facets, in all functions, in all his knowing and creating? I can't. I don't know anyone else who can except in this manner. They say, if you want to know who God is and what he's like, he's exactly like Jesus Christ. Because remember, the God of we made man in our image, that same God shows men, shows mankind, us humans on the earth, who he is through Jesus. Now, doctrinally, it's not correct to say God is exactly like Jesus, but it sure makes the point. He is his father's son. And that God is one that 
holds himself in mystery for some people. He holds himself in austere positions for some people. Even long-time believers want to prove God's existence. But how could you do that? There's no way to measure, to quantify, to put a tape measure around and to weigh who God is and see that part of him. But on the other side of that same issue, God is very much like a piece of the creation we call the wind. The wind is there. It was here yesterday. We didn't see the wind, but we saw the effect of it. And God is very much like that, posing an effect and a result on mankind. Sometimes it is the follow-through of an unjust person receiving the reprimand and the punishment that God said, you will receive this if you don't cease. You will get what you're seeking if you don't cease. Now, in the creation and in our lives, God has not left himself without testimony. Now, testimony is, hey, did you hear about? Hey, did you see when? That's testimony. God has not left himself without that. Acts 14 and verse 17 talks about it. God's not left himself without testimony. And that testimony is Jesus. It's also Saul, when God tapped him on the shoulder on the highway, heading to another town, and said, basically, Paul, what are you doing? And at that moment, he suddenly realized a little bit of who God was, enough so that his own men stood there in fear over this invisible intelligence that spoke to Saul that they heard. That was the God who came and met Saul on that road and said, I will show you the authority of who I am. Now, for part of our lives here, we look at the creation. We tend to look at it as a place to play when we're little. And as we move into adulthood, it becomes a place to appreciate beauty and appreciate the things the creation brings. We go hiking, we go camping, we go hunting. And as we become veterans in the middle part of our life, we marvel at the creation and the handiwork that it took to create it. In Psalms 19 verse 1, that tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. And Romans 1.20 tells us, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Creation itself tells us about something that is God. God went to the point, he went to the complete plan and put in place sunlight that creates vitamins and minerals in humans' bodies, sunlight that causes plants to grow, food to come from it, rain which feeds it, oceans which teem with food. God had the foresight and the creation to put everything in place that we need, everything that we might want, and everything that is appropriate. But notice, we don't always get everything we want out of the creation, unless we're wanting what God wants for us. God put that all in place, and holding up the creation, by the way, we're part of that, we're in the middle of that creation, both in being able to experience and use it to receive the blessing and the benefit of it, to be able to receive the damage and the consequences it can bring 
in a hurricane, in a tsunami, in a tornado. But through all that, there is also design. God put a design in place that holds the creation. And that design was intentional. It was specific. Genesis says, we made you guys in our image, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That design carries on through life on the earth. That is living. Now, there are some cold-blooded animals. There are some animals with skeletons inside. There are some with skeletons outside. There are some that are warm-blooded mammals that nurse their young. There's this diversity in the world in life that lives. And that design for that was made by God. Now, some will claim there is no God. It had to be an accident that it came to be, that life was granted on this planet. But yet, through the acts of family and acts of loving each other and friends, the families that are created and that exist here on the earth uh, for generations, one of the things that comes out of that is love. In some cases, even hate. But in that love, there is a yearning to be with others. Sometimes the yearning is there for years before the person finds someone else. That, the creation, the design, all of those things being intentional, we have to look at one thing. There's a plan. Why was man created? Why does man exist? And the answer is, again, there's a plan. Now, at this point in time, David be squirming in his chair, raising his hand, wanting to say, yeah, there is. And it's the plan that God designed you for a specific purpose. Now, for me, I know part of the plan was for me to marry my girlfriend, have my daughter absorb more than a handful of pseudo-foster kids, make friends, and then have friends who called me and said, you need to go up to Federal Way and help. And now we find ourselves sitting here today. But in that design and in that creative manner that God put everything in place here, everything is for a purpose. Life is based upon complexity in chemicals. Complexity in mental things. It's based upon complexity of using and interfacing with the environment. And we see that tested all the time. When they had the big earthquake in Japan and the tidal wave wiped out the nuclear reactor, do you think anybody said, oh, we're going to have a great big earthquake and a big tidal wave that's going to wipe out the reactor? No. I doubt if anybody planned for that and thought it's coming, especially on this day. But what I do know is that people depend upon the order of the ocean, its flow, its function, its chemistry, its ability to feed mankind. They depend on that persistent, consistent nature of the ocean, which came from a creator. And by simple fact, that portrays the creator as structured, intelligent, planning. Now, when we look at God and who God is, one of the things that God is used for often, often, uh, often Christians use God for this, and that is to establish morality and ethical standards. Now, if I said, how does that work? What does that look like? Does anybody have an idea or a thought of how we use God for 
morality and ethical standards? How many people understand sin? And then there's a penalty for sin. I think we all do. We've all heard that phrase. We've seen movies about it, maybe not called sin and the consequences, but we've seen stories about people that suffered the consequences of certain actions. God is all about morality in a huge way, in a way that sometimes is very hard to comprehend. And the way he goes about morality is the same way Jesus went about it. Now, when Jesus was teaching in the edge, on the, on the very outskirts of a town one time, the uh, political authorities of the day brought this woman they had captured in her uh, sexual sin and brought her to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Did he yell at her and say, shame on you, you knew better? No. Did Jesus say, well, you're, you're going to die for that and go to hell? No. Why not? How come Jesus didn't say anything to her and tell her to her face? This is what you've bought. This is what you deserve. This is what you're going to get. She already knew that. She came into that moment where they brought her to Jesus. And God shows Jesus' morality in a very unique way here. Through the choice of God, we see Jesus put himself between the accused woman. Clearly, she was wrong. And the accusers. And Jesus basically puts her in a position of being treated the way God intended her to be treated. Jesus puts her in the position of protection under God directly. Now, that's how God looks at morality. The morality of life, the morality of sin, the morality of choice. As people, God created us free moral agency human beings. The right to choose. Now, there's no question at all about God's greatness when we ask what sort of a being is God. We can realize he's bigger than we can imagine. We can also realize that if he created the universe, that's a lot of creation. That's a lot of organization and structure to put in place in a creation. God surely did not create the earth and everything that we have here and only be able to plan halfway through and then push the magic button and make it and see what happened. The reason we can know that is because the Bible, whom God caused to be canonized from the writings of old, the Bible as the supreme authority speaking what God believes and what Jesus believes and the Holy Spirit believes, that Bible, being that authority, says that God knows all, is all to mankind, and can be everywhere. Now, at this point, we're going to jump to something a little bit on the side over here. Uh, as a friend of mine likes to say, we're going to go down a... Uh, uh, Holy Ghost trail over here off to the side of it. When we think of God, there are some basic facts about God that tell us how he operates. The first one is God is omnipotent. What does that mean? Well, after you scratch your head for a minute, it simply means... He's able to do whatever he wants. He is the Almighty. And the second fact, God is immortal and constant in character. He's always reliable. He is the eternal. Now, if he made the creation, 
I think little kids would understand this. If God made the creation, he's going to stay with it and be with it and be involved all the way through time, eternity. There is not a planned time when God retires. Now compare that to little kids that take their dolls and their trucks and get in a sandbox and play in the sandbox for a couple of hours. And then all of a sudden they want to go home and they're done. Sometimes they don't even want to clean their mess up and put the toys away. Sometimes we as humans are like those children and we get to a point where we might choose to say, I want to be done here. Okay, I'm not going to go over there and do that. But God isn't like that. He provided for us to be eternal in two different ways here. The most common way is to be eternal in the sense of living spiritually, living a spiritual life after death and coming into that wholeness that we read about. But there is also living eternally the rest of our days as God intended us to live with the morality of Jesus Christ with the mindset of loving. The third point here, God is omnipresent. He is not limited by time and space. Now, can you imagine God not being limited by time or space, and he's always near, but he's also over there? Now, how in the world do you get your mind around that? Omnipresent. Well, you know what? I remember as a little kid growing up, I was, I think, seven years old, and my cousins and I went and hopped on a freight train. And I think the oldest was nine or ten. And we rode a train 20 miles out of town and got off and played at a rock quarry all day. And all of a sudden, we noticed the sun was going down, and the last train had already gone by going back to town. None of us understood that the headlights we kept seeing behind us while we were walking down the road was someone watching us. And then we'd get to a place at a cross street and that car would disappear. And all of a sudden we'd see people come out the door of their house and stand on the porch and watch us go down the street. It didn't occur to us that these were all people that were looking out for us for the benefit of our grandma and our moms and dads. There is that omnipresence that I learned about as a little kid. My mom and dad's spirit, their intent for me was present everywhere I went because people knew who I was, who I belonged to, and those eyes and awareness were always there. So it is with God, and so it is with us. He watches us. And in the moment of need, Miss Diane's family needs something. God is there. We heard the testimony of that the other day. And at the same time, someone somewhere else in desperate need in India turns to God, and he is there omnipresent. He made this marble and everything on it. He is all over it. We'll put it that way. God is omniscient, number four. Knowing all truth and wisdom. By definition, if God created all, he knows all. And we got to remember the TV show said it correctly. Father knows best. That's the way God is. And number five, God is consistently good, never selfish. God is love. Now, I'd never thought of God as being selfish. But when I thought about it, I realized that the New Testament is all about going away from God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and coming to and being received by mankind, by moms and dads and sons and daughters and uncles and aunts and nieces and nephews. 
God is consistently good, never selfish. If somebody had to ask what is one of the major attributes of God, it is love. It is love. The fact that Jesus came who he is, and what he was, was living, breathing love. Jesus came and he was help. He was encouragement. He was caring. He was willing to get into things where a lot of people won't tread. He was willing to, as we might say, get in the trenches with his people. And it takes love and appreciation and some understanding for us to look at that the way Jesus did. To look at it from the standpoint of how do I love this person or that person? In today's world, we see a lot of people that are broken. We see some that are born that way. We see others that come to a point that their brokenness rules their life. And even in that, God gives a promise. Unselfishly, he said, I will send my son who's a piece of me, God in the flesh, and I'll give that piece of myself for you so that you don't have to die that consequence that sin demands. So we have a God now who shows us he's omnipotent, he's immortal, that is forever, he's omnipresent, and that is simply that he is everywhere, he is omniscient, knowing all things. Why? Because he made everything. And that he is consistently good. Now, a lot of people wrestle with the Old Testament God. And then the difference that Jesus pointed at and taught in the New Testament. The thing that we must remember is... Jesus pointed out the Old Testament law, that Old Covenant, wasn't good or bad. It wasn't right or wrong. The Old Testament covenant and the law became obsolete. And all that means is no longer needed because of something. And that something that God brought and put in place was very simple and very basic. I'm going to establish a relationship with you. I told you all about it through the Old Testament, the Old Covenant of the Old Testament. Foretold, it showed, it pointed at, it led us to. And that thing that it points at is Jesus. It is Jesus Christ. When we look at our lives and people, and we think of what is needed on this earth, there are so many times that I find myself unable to do anything, and I realize only Jesus can get a handle on that and work on it. I can't. The Holy Spirit can. Sometimes I can't. But God has a plan, he has a way, he is there. He is supporting us by consistently being good, never selfish, and always loving. God defines right and wrong. We talked about that a little bit. And God has the power to always do right because he made good and evil came out of it by free moral choice. Lucifer became Satan. And God is still good. James 1.13 talks about uh, God cannot be tempted with evil. He's consistently and perfectly righteous. Psalms 11 verse 7 also. Now, here's one of the biggest things about God. 
When we think of old times, Roman citizens, when we think of the people that Jesus ministered to and that Paul and the disciples went to, culturally, what was one of the most significant points that the disciples and Jesus dealt with? It was the fact that those cultures had gods. Some had seven, some had six, some had nine, some had 12. And in that, can you imagine going to that culture and then shedding your light upon the people, being kind and loving, and then having them say, well, what's this weird hope you have? And then you tell them about Jesus. And at the end of the day, they look at you and say, wait a minute, you're proposing there's only one God to play, pray for, one God to love, one God who loves me, one God I obey, and only one God that I have to live and be concerned with? That was so countercultural that it cost some people their lives. But the point is, that is God. One God, one God who loves, one God to be loved. One God who gives, people who receive from the one God who gives. The God who loves enough to give a part of himself to pay the penalty for sin, and the people receive. Notice everything starts moving towards the people receive. Now, if all we knew about God is that he had incredible power over us. If that's all we knew, he had the power. He could destroy at will or create at will. Would we obey him without question? Would we obey him without concern? Or might we obey him with some fear? If all we knew was his power and his authority. I think as we've seen demonstrated by a lot of people, we might be willing to be on bent knee and be very reverent out of fear. I know I've lived that in my life in years past. Fear, a little bit of trepidation. But God has revealed to us another aspect of his character, of his nature. God is incredibly gentle and good, and the New Testament reinforces that. But more than that, Jesus was and is incredible and good. You know, I sit and think of what it was like when uh, I started serving up here in this congregation in 2005. And then we moved up here from Stillicum in 2006. And then in 2007, I died in the ER. I was only dead for a minute and a half. But the significant part of that was, in my mind, my heart was still here. And I was granted an opportunity to make a choice. And my choice was... How do we understand thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven if I now understand thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? I must be there to share it, to teach it, to live it with people. I must be there to demonstrate it. And so I chose, I want to be with my family, with my friends. And in that goodness, I was granted that choice to be here. Now, I don't know if I went in a spiritual moment to see that in, in the vision I have. I don't know if I went physically, but I know what I remember. And what I remember was God was good, and God told me, let him choose. He doesn't have to be here with us in heaven. He also doesn't have to stay where he was. It is his choice. Now that flies in the face of reason to some people. But that is all about the goodness of God. 
Let him choose. Now, when we think of God, remember, think of Jesus. God is exactly like Jesus. Jesus gave himself unconditionally and allowed all of the weight of mankind's sin to come upon his shoulders. And he was put on the cross and crucified. And in that, we have no concern for the sin and its consequences falling on us. If. What is the if? We have no concern for the sin and the consequences of it falling on us if we are in the relationship that God asks for with him. If we're in that relationship that he asks for, we are to be connected and be operating, working on, functioning in the relationship day to day. Uh, this morning, uh, some of us were talking, and you guys heard me say it. Um, you don't live the Sabbath on the Sabbath day. You live in the Sabbath all day long, and the Sabbath is Jesus. The rest is Jesus. We live in and through Jesus, who is sent from God, and who is here to really nurture us and help us, to give us strength. Now, Jesus is called Emmanuel, and if you remember what Emmanuel means, it means God with us. Matthew 1, verse 23. Jesus' pure and holy life without sin was lived with passion, and God has a love and a joy like we saw with Jesus. You've got to remember how Jesus went realize this, it was not time for Jesus to be resurrected yet. But a dear friend dies, and Jesus goes and resurrects him. And that family got to see the future before it was delivered. God puts those moments in our lives where we see a hint of what will be. We were talking the other day, Curtis and I, and we talked about a very simple idea. Are you a luck and circumstance and chance kind of person, or are you a signs and wonders kind of person? I used to not differentiate. I didn't care. I was, Rick, this is who I am. But today now, I am here. And I will tell you, I haven't thought in terms of luck or chance in so many years. I don't remember when. I am a, <clears throat> a signs <clears throat> and wonders kind of a person. I am a person who now looks for those markers from God. Show me on this journey today. Show me tomorrow when I need to know what your will is. And that comes all the time for us. God is like that. He, he wants to deliver and give us and lead us to and help us with things. And that comes through Jesus. God is like that. He gives a piece of himself for us. God described himself to Moses in this way. The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Now look at everything that came before the guilty receiving their punishment. We can think of it in simple terms. Well, choose to do good. Well, that's easy to say. That's very hard to do perpetually. But through Jesus, the issue isn't you failed. The issue is thank you for not giving up. 
I will give you my son. He will be your brother. He will be the Lord and master of your life. You see, in Jesus, God entered human history. He worked in flesh, showing us what life should be like in the flesh, showing us that God wants more for our lives and for our well-being. The God who is angry at sin also provides salvation, as we've said several times, through a piece of himself we know is Jesus Christ. He's mighty in mercy, great in gentleness. This is what should be expected from a being who can create the codes in DNA and make the DNA chain that man has and the DNA chain of a chimpanzee one number different. Now this is literal. In a chimpanzee there are two genes that are like this. And their number, I'll just arbitrarily say 13 and 14. That's a chimpanzee. In mankind, those two genes are connected and that makes us human, not a chimpanzee. That same God who created that and put that in place is the God who calls out to us, come, come, I want you to come. He calls the church Jesus' bride. He calls the saints in the kingdom today, the people that we know in the body of believers in the church. He calls his children. We know through the story of the prodigal son that God wishes no one to be lost, to be forgotten, to be unloved. God is there for us and we are to be there for him in relationship, in function, in participation, in joining in and being joined with him. Now we're going to stop at that point today. Next week I'll speak on a little bit more of this. And then we're going to dive into this series and at this point in time, I don't think we can say we'll be done in six months or a year or 18 months. We'll be done when we're done. But it is very important that we understand the doctrine that is God. And so with that, um, I'm going to pray for a minute here. God, thank you for today again. Thank you for leading us to this journey. We're going to participate in and this path we're going to go down regarding you and the very truth and authority of who you are. We thank you for the fact that we're here in safety and elsewhere in the world there is none. We thank you for the fact that you've given us freedom and peace in a lot of communities in America. Be with those communities that don't find the peace. We ask you to bless the hearts and the minds of the parents that have lost children at the colleges around the U.S. Bless those families that can't find enough tranquility to even close their eyes in these times of need and turmoil. And now, before we start our Bible study, bless our lunch, bless our food, bless our minds and hearts, and let us receive the teaching we'll have this afternoon. And we thank you for the fellowship and for the caring and the love and the things that you've put around us here that demonstrate your desire for us and for providing us in that way. In Jesus' holy and righteous name we pray, amen. We're gonna